Welcome to our discussion of Reconstruction, which is the decade after the Civil War. Before we jump into the details of Reconstruction in Texas, I'd like to spend five or six minutes reviewing the entire process of Reconstruction across the, the former Confederacy. So Reconstruction essentially consisted of rebuilding the Federal Union, incorporating the states that had left the United States to form the Confederacy, bringing them back in politically, economically, and of course socially. And the real question was how to treat the defeated South. What will be the future of over 4 million former slaves? Almost half the population of the Confederacy consisted of slaves. What is their future? How are they going to eat next week? Where are they going to go? All these questions had to be answered and dealt with. And a major question I've indicated in red is, who is in charge of this process? <clears throat> is it the federal government? The national government in Washington, D.C.? or the states of the former Confederacy that are coming in. Then, once the Reconstruction process starts, is the President in charge or the U.S. Congress? And what we'll see <clears throat> at the national level, and this includes Texas, at first Reconstruction was called Presidential Reconstruction the first few years. That phase ended, but the most of the Republicans in Congress felt that not enough had been done. I mean, there'd been a war for four years with the Confederacy, and the governments that came, that were put in place, were essentially racist governments consisting of many former Confederates. And so the U.S. Congress took over the Reconstruction process after two years and ran the reconstruction process for three years. Now this occurs throughout the South, including Texas. And we'll see more details on Texas in a minute. <clears throat> now Texas, as we looked at in the last lecture, was spared physical damage during the Civil War because there were very, very few battles fought in Texas and those that were fought in Texas tended to be um, along the coast and the borders of Texas. But much of the rest of the, the Southern Confederacy faced extensive damage. Uh, this is a photo in Charleston, South Carolina. Another one in Charleston, South Carolina. It almost looks, doesn't it, like photos you've seen of uh, European cities during World War II. <clears throat> this is Atlanta, Georgia, the the area, the train station and the area around it. <clears throat> and so the nation was totally divided during the Civil War. This is just a map to refresh your memory. Um, you know, Texas, we'll see there, of course, was part of the Confederacy, the Confederate States of America. Those states just to the north of it, uh, shown in green, were the so-called border states. They remained in the United States, in the Union, even though they had slaves. In blue, of course, we see the states that did not secede that stayed in the United States. And then we have this huge area in the West called Western Territories. This was area controlled by the federal government or national government owned by it. But um, there were not sufficient settlers there yet to um, request statehood. <clears throat> now, President Lincoln... Um, had taken a very lenient approach to Reconstruction. Of course, he was assassinated right at the end of the Civil War, but it had been obvious for several months that uh, the North was going to win and the Confederacy would, would be defeated. And uh, this is one of his famous statements on the direction he wanted the post-war Reconstruction to take. With malice toward none, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle, and for his widow and orphan, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves. And this is a very famous 
quote from Abraham Lincoln, but you can imagine for many in the North, they didn't quite feel as lenient because many people had a member of their family who'd been killed, taken prisoner, or suffered uh, wounds, uh, been injured in, during the Civil War. <clears throat> this was a political cartoon from the time. Uh, here we see Abraham Lincoln, the tall man on the right, um, trying to hold up sort of a, a globe representing the United States while his vice president, Andrew Johnson, is sitting there trying to stitch the country back together. Now, of course, immediately following Abraham Lincoln's assassination, um, Andrew Johnson became vice president. And Johnson had been born in great, great poverty. In fact, he often mentioned he'd only learned how to read as an adult. And he had been selected by Lincoln um, as the vice presidential candidate because he had been a senator from a Confederate state and he had remained loyal to the Union, even though his state hadn't. Um, and he had a, the same general approach as Lincoln. He felt there should be leniency. And many people charged that, well, he was essentially a Southerner and sympathetic to slavery. <clears throat> now, essentially, after the conclusion of, of fighting in the Civil War, the South was was taken over by the North. It's it's very similar to you look at the end of World War II. The United States occupied Japan for a number of years, and the United States, uh, France, and, and Britain. Um, occupied uh, much of Germany, and Russia occupied Germany um, for a number of years. So there were ma demands made on the South. If they wanted to come back in the United States, after all, they had, in the view of, of the uh, Northerners, they tr committed treason. They had left the United States. They had started a war. They fired the first shots at Fort Sumter. And you can't pretend there aren't emotions involved in both, in both the North and the South. Many, many, many people have been killed and there was so much suffering. So <clears throat> one of the terms was all the Southern states, including Texas, had to abolish slavery in state law. And what that meant is they had to write new constitutions and not mention slavery. They were required to ratify the 13th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution which you will recall from the last lecture, um, became part of the Constitution just before the end of the Civil War, and that abolished the institution of slavery. And the Southern states had to renounce su succession. The, you know, the, they also, but what every state in the South did was it complied minimally did the minimum to check the boxes. They rewrote the state constitutions, we'll see this in Texas, took out all mention of slavery, and they approved the 13th Amendment in principle, and they renounced, in the case of Texas, the um, legislative decision to leave the United States. However, they did not allow blacks to vote. So they rejected black suffrage. This was not one of the minimum requirements from the North. So you may, essentially after the Civil War, the whites who had run the states during the Civil War, the former Confederates, were in charge. To put this in context, though, <clears throat> let's remember at this time there were 21 northern states and 11 of those, over half of the states in the North, still did not allow blacks to vote. <clears throat> now, the slaves are freed. So what happens? Well, this is one of the major problems we'll see both nationally and in Texas. <clears throat> they quickly created some of their own communities and institutions, and by far the most important of these institutions were churches. And 
these churches had black ministers who became prominent community leaders because they were educated and the people in their congregations looked to them for both spiritual advice as well as practical advice. And it's no coincidence that the famous civil rights leader, Martin Luther King Jr., was himself a minister. And at first he was preaching um, about civil rights in his church and people looked to him as an educated person and a community leader. <clears throat> this is a photo. Um, this isn't from Texas, but it could have been, and this is a small church, and you can see the gentleman standing up in the middle. That is the black minister. <clears throat> now, the federal government uh, set up a bureau called the Freedmen's Bureau, and freedmen here refers to men and obviously women who had been freed, so the former slaves. And this bureau operated in all the states of the former Confederacy, and including Texas. And the Freedmen's Bureau essentially sent people down to set up schools for the poor black, for the, not the poor blacks, all the blacks, newly freed slaves, as well as um, the freed blacks, to, um, to also help the blacks write contracts because the blacks were now free, they weren't slaves. Many will continue working for their former owner who will give them a contract to sign. And of course, most of the slaves, or very few of them can read or write, so they needed someone there by their side to help them get a fair deal. Now it's interesting, the Freedmen's Bureau was criticized even by people in the North. This newspaper article you see was not published in the South. This was published in Philadelphia, uh, Pennsylvania. And you can see the drawing of the, the very racist drawing of the uh, black there. And around the black, you see the white people hard at work cutting firewood and plowing the fields. And it says the Freedmen's Bureau, an agency to keep the Negro, to keep the Negro in idleness at the expense of the white man. It, it was created by Congress. Um, and of course, this would also portray the attitude in the South. This is just a drawing showing uh, a woman from the North, or several women from the North, who'd gone South to try and teach practical skills to the newly fra freed f slave women. And here we have them uh, teaching them how to, to knit and sew. Well, the Southern whites who'd been defeated were, first of all, obviously angry they were defeated. Um, they had believed, as we saw in the last lecture, they were going to quickly beat the North in the Civil War because they were better fighters and, you know, they were fighting for Southern honor and for their way of life. Well, what the Southern whites did is they legally subordinated the blacks through what were called black codes. The, you'll recall during slavery, there were, there were laws called slave codes. Now, there are no more slaves, they call them black codes. And we'll see in detail in Texas, these did things like uh, prohibited blacks from being in the same train cars as whites, uh, prohibited blacks essentially from voting, uh, from attending school, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and there was also a violent reaction by uh, terror groups, and the most famous is the Ku Klux Klan, and there were others. And what they would do is in the South. Remember, the South is essentially occupied by Northerners. They would ride around at night and try and scare the blacks uh, who were trying to, you know, be elected as a local official or whatnot. They also carried out violent attacks against whites, uh, white Republicans, the Republican Party, which was trying to help the blacks. Any employees of the Freedmen's Bureau, they wanted to terrorize them so they would leave the South and go back North. And they also carried out attacks against Roman Catholics. And you might wonder why Roman Catholics. 
it's because the South was overwhelmingly Protestant and Roman Catholics were viewed as not lo being loyal Americans because the argument went the primary loyalty of a Catholic is to the Pope in Rome and they were called Papists. And we will, we will see later in the 1920s when the Ku Klux Klan reappeared, it actually, um, its primary objective was Roman Catholics and Jews. <clears throat> so here we have a drawing from the time of, you know, the Ku Klux Klan. <clears throat> These are some other drawings of the Ku Klux Klan. <clears throat> well, President Johnson had set, set very minimal requirements for Reconstruction to end, and those all took place within two years. So President Johnson told the news media at the time, essentially the newspapers, well, Reconstruction is over, the Union is restored. And most Republicans strongly disagreed. And remember, jo uh, Johnson was a Republican. And in Congress, they said, wait, just a minute. Yes, they've checked the boxes in the Confederacy, these minimal requirements, but former officials of the Confederacy are still running the, running the states, officers in the Confederate Army, racist. And what was this all, all about? And so Congress took over the entire Reconstruction program uh, for three years. And the, the real effort was to use federal or national power to protect the basic rights in the South, as well as protect um, free labor, because there was a real concern that the freed blacks, most of whom were working on the same plantations as the as they'd been slaves, uh, they were signing contracts which, while it didn't make them slaves, it um, they were contracts that would not have been entered into by white people. <clears throat> and then we already saw the Thirteenth Amendment abolishing slavery. There were two other very very significant amendments passed during this time. And these, all three of these are called the Reconstruction Amendments. The 13th, abolishing slavery. The 14th, constitutional guarantee of equality before the law. Everyone has to be treated equally before the law. It also extends the U.S. Constitution, including the first 10 amendments, the Bill of Rights, um, against action by state governments. And at this period of time, a very important provision of the 14th Amendment was on U.S. citizenship. It said all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States. So what does this mean? It means that the blacks are citizens of the United States. Because you will recall the famous U.S. Supreme Court Dred Scott decision in the 1850s, the Supreme Court of the United States had said that blacks are not citizens of the United States. And so it was necessary now uh, to make it clear that they were. Uh, just rather interesting, it says, all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof, that's, that includes three groups. Well, that includes one group, the American Indians. The American Indians were treated as separate nations, tribal nations, and had treaties with the United States government. And so American Indians were not United States citizens. They were citizens of their tribe, whether it was you know, the Comanche or the Sioux or whatever. And it was only in the 1920s that indigenous people in the United States became U.S. citizens. Also, there are two exceptions um, to the statement, all people born in the United States are citizens of the United States. I ask my students that in class and nobody knows. Some people say, well, if the parents don't have legal documentation to be in the U.S., and well, that's not, anyone can, doesn't matter who your parents are, if they're here with permission or not, 
uh, if it, someone is born in the United States, they are a U.S. citizen. The two exceptions are children of foreign diplomats because foreign diplomats you know, working in embassies or consulates uh, generally, genuine, generally have uh, diplomatic immunity. They can't be arrested in the United States. They don't pay taxes. And so they're not subject to the jurisdiction of the United States. And so their children are not citizens of the United States. The other exception uh, is a rather obscure one, but it's children of an invading army. So if an army invades the United States, which of course happened in 1812 with the war with Britain, if you know there had been some women coming along uh, in that group that invaded, their children would not be U.S. citizens. <clears throat> and also important in the long term and what makes the 14th Amendment perhaps one of the most important provisions of the Constitution is the guarantee for due process of law and, quote, equal protection of the laws. That phrase is often used by the U.S. Supreme Court um, to make many, many decisions. Uh, what is equal protection of the law? Um, and that phrase was used, in, of course, um, in the controversial decisions dealing with abortion, same-sex marriage, and many, many other issues. <clears throat> now, return to voting rights for blacks. The states still determined who would vote, and that is only subject to general uh, U.S. law and particularly the Constitution. Now, the Republicans wanted to guarantee black suffrage in the South for two reasons. One was morally. The Republicans felt very strongly, started with Abraham Lincoln, that, you know, the blacks should have the right to vote. And at this time, they weren't called blacks. They were called either Negro, Negroes generally, Negroes. Um, uh, and the Republicans also had a selfish reason. With so many blacks in the South, almost half the population of the South, if the Republicans could get the votes of the blacks, that would help the Republicans win more seats in Congress, keep a majority in Congress, and also win more presidential elections. <clears throat> now, in an effort to pre prevent these southern states from blocking uh, black voting rights, the 15th Amendment to the Constitution uh, was drafted and it was approved by Congress and the requisite number of states. And this prohibited both federal and state governments from denying suffrage or the right or, the, or voting on the basis of race, color, or previous conditions of servitude. So a state cannot write in its constitution or pass a law that no one of the African race can vote, or, well, or no one of the Asian race for that matter, or no former slave can vote. So that's considered previous conditions of servitude, okay? Now, there are a big loophole, and this was used by all the southern states, including Texas. The 15th Amendment does not prohibit the states from limiting suffrage for other grounds. In other words, states would say, well, you have to pass a test, a literacy test. You have to be able to read and write. And, you know, that just makes sense, they would say. How can you be a citizen and make important decisions unless you can read and write? Or in some states, it was a, a test on the Constitution, a test that was so difficult that only a constitutional expert could pass it. Or you had to pay a poll tax. You know, the, the states would say, well, it costs money to run the election, so you have to pay a few dollars sales tax. Most of the, of the freed slaves didn't have cash like that. And if a poor white went up to vote, well, there were whites running the voting stations, and they'd just say, oh, Farmer Billy Bob, go ahead. We know you. Go ahead and vote. And very important, 15th Amendment. Uh, I mean, there, 
you can still deny the right to vote based on gender. So there's still no voting rights for women. Now, when the 15th Amendment was being drafted and discussed in Congress, the wives of many U.S. senators and representatives said, why don't we get the right to vote? Why don't you include us? Um, but it wasn't included. And this was particularly uh, detested by white women in the South who started to see during Reconstruction their former slaves voting, and they themselves, as women, did not have the right to vote. And we'll see in detail in this lecture and others how the state of Texas, just like the other states in the South, use these loopholes to effectively prevent virtually all blacks from voting until the 1950s and 1960s, for almost 100 years. <clears throat> this is a New York publication um, showing uh, black people voting in the South. And you know the article talks about how great this was. You can see this is from uh, November 1867. You can see a black gentleman putting his vote in. Uh, you can, and one thing that's interesting, you notice there are two big like bottles to put it in. There was not a secret ballot in the North or the South. Uh, one of those, let's, let's say the one on the right is for a certain candidate, the one on the left. So everybody could see who you voted for. There was no secret voting as we have now. Uh, here's another drawing of uh, voting in the South. Um, and you can see black people there submitting um, their vote. In fact, you can see the three people running the election. One of them is black. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, this map is particularly interesting. What It shows several things, but one thing you can see the colors running across the South. The dark red means 50% or more of the population is black in 1880. And you can you recall when we looked at the economy of the South, this, this is essentially were the slaves. This is where the most of the slaves were. And around, in Texas, you can see all around uh, the Houston area, East Texas. It's generally above 30% slaves, of, excuse me, blacks, um, and the yellow is 10 to 30 percent. So a high percentage of the population was black in um, 1880. Uh, you, you could also see under the name of each state that was in the Confederacy, um, the date of uh, readmission to the Union. And you can see in Texas that was March 30th, 1870. And then the second date is the date when conservative rule was reestablished. And this is conservative rule by Democrats, and they're called Redemption Democrats, we'll see later in Texas. And these are former Confederates, largely, who took over the state governments. And so from this period, the date of reestablishment of conservative rule this is the Democratic Party, and this continues until the 1960s. 1960s, the South is solidly Democratic. Um, the white, the very few, if any, blacks can vote anywhere. And that will, of course, change later, and we'll look at that in more detail uh, in Texas later in the course. So... <clears throat> Just two more slides here on general reconstruction and then we'll jump into Texas. How did re why did reconstruction end? Well, it ended because of a political deal struck in Washington, D.C. There was a presidential election in 1876, which by coincidence was the centennial of American independence. And the two leading candidates were the Democrat Samuel Tilden and the Republican Rutherford Hayes. Now, you recall that the presidential election is not determined then or now by who gets the most votes, but rather by, through our complicated system of the Electoral College. And it turned out that 
the election had to be decided by the House of Representatives because neither had the requisite number of votes in the uh, Electoral College. So people got together in a smoke-filled room and they came up with the famous Compromise of 1877. And the compromise was the Republican candidate, Hayes, would become president. So the Republicans got what they wanted. Now, in any good compromise, both sides get something. Well, what did the Democrats want? The Democrats wanted the reconstruction process to end in the South. The Democrats um, had already started to take over control of the South. And they wanted Reconstruction to formally end in the South. No more U.S. Army troops there. No more U.S. officials from the North coming down trying to help the blacks. And so the Compromise of 1877, people shook their hands on. And that ended, formally ended Reconstruction. And it meant from then on, the Southern states went back to essentially um, the status quo before the Civil War, except there was no slavery. Slavery was abolished, but um, uh, the end of Reconstruction. Now, let's look just briefly at the legacy of Reconstruction for the United States, and we'll look at it more detail in a minute for Texas. Well, it did abolish slavery. We had the 13th Amendment. And the 14th and 15th Amendments to the Constitution are very important, guaranteeing due process of law, equal treatment, and in the 15th Amendment, the right for blacks to vote. Even though it was violated, it's there in the Constitution. <clears throat> well, the Southern Democrats, as I mentioned before, were very, very effective and clever mechanisms they came up with, they thought they were clever, to basically prevent blacks from participating in politics until the 1950s or 1960s. Now, that's a struggle throughout the southern part of the United States, in fact, in, in the entire United States, and Texas being part of the South, uh, we'll be looking at that in, in detail as we move along in the course. Okay. I hope you found that overview of Reconstruction useful, particularly if you haven't studied uh, general U.S. history in a while, because Texas is part of the South. It was part of the Confederacy. And the way Reconstruction plays out in Texas is exactly the same as the rest of the South, although the details are somewhat different. <clears throat> well, first and foremost, let's look at the all-important date of June 19th, 1865. This is called Juneteenth. Juneteenth means June 19th. Well, what happened on that date? Well, on that date, the Union General Granger and about 2,000 troops landed in Galveston and they, General Granger told the slaves there, you are free under the terms of the Emancipation Proclamation, which we looked at in the last lecture, this area is no longer under rebel control. And so I now declare all of you and all the slaves in Texas free. And this was obviously a major event for the slaves. Uh, most of them couldn't read and write. And so they'd never even heard of this. And it was celebrated in the African-American community, started in southern Texas as Juneteenth. Now Juneteenth actually became a national holiday in June 2021 when the U.S. Senate voted in unanimously to make it a national holiday and it was signed into law by President Biden. By the end of 1865, virtually all Texas slaves were free. Well you might ask why it takes so long. Well News would travel slowly. Also, slave, many slaveholders weren't eager to run out and tell their slaves they were free, particularly um, in the summer months when they had the slaves out working in the field and then harvesting cotton and other crops. So it took a while for the, uh, the news to spread. And 
So we can assume by the end of 1865, virtually all the slaves are free, except in some isolated places. Well, many whites, and not just slave owners, resented this. Many poor whites who didn't have slaves resented this because they had looked down on the slaves. Uh, the slave owners had looked down on the poor whites and called them poor white trash throughout the South, including Texas. And now the whites, you know, were essentially economic competitors to the freed blacks. And then there were some threats of violence. This is a photo from 1900 of a group of uh, blacks um, celebrating Juneteenth. <clears throat> so the slaves are freed. Now what happens? Well, that's great, but they have to eat. What's their future? It's very important, the second point I have on this slide. The vast majority of the slaves worked on large farms or plantations. That land, the cotton plantation, for instance, that land was not divided up and given to the slaves. That land remained the property of the slaveholder who now no longer had slaves. So the options for the slaves were, you know, many of the slaveholders said, okay, you're free, but I want you to stay here. I want you to work on my land, you know, for the slave, former slaveholder, that was his livelihood. And, you know, but others said, well, you know, the slaves were free to leave and some went off to look for family members that it may have been sold off somewhere else or trying to find other economic activities. That was very limited because they didn't have cash. They didn't have a lot of cash. They couldn't just jump on a bus and go somewhere, obviously. Um, so it was more difficult than you'd probably think. I mean, what are these people going to do? So most ended up staying sort of in the area, an immediate area where they were. And most had been employed in agriculture. Most, that was what they knew how to do. And most of the people in the South, including whites, were in agriculture. Or they started working as sharecroppers. A sharecropper, as the name suggests, means you work on someone else's land and they give you a share of the crops. For instance, you work on the land, you use the uh, landowner's tools. Uh, you might live in a little house provided by the landowner. And then you produce, whether it's cotton or whatever it is, and when you produce it, um, an agreed upon percentage goes to the landowner and you keep the rest to sell. And in that case, there's a contract and that's why it was so important to have people from like the Freedmen Bureau there to advise the slaves on the contract they were signing. Or you could work for wages. You could go and work for, you know, pay for your own little housing um, and go and get paid on a daily basis. Some people actually managed to buy very small farms. And the last point here, many in practice continued to work for their former owners, um, which when you think about it, it was pretty natural because that's where they lived. Um, most Many people had never been off the plantation or never been more than a mile or two away. So they were very, very limited in their options. Uh, this is a, a view photo taken <clears throat> during this period of uh, the black sharecroppers in Texas. And I might note that there were many, many white sharecroppers in Texas and in fact throughout the United States. So it was not entirely blacks who were sharecroppers. <clears throat> so presidential reconstructions, the first two years here of reconstruction, the end of the Civil War in 1865. So, President Johnson was very moderate. He just said, you, all you southern states, we want you back in. You have to just accept the fact you were defeated and remove all mention of slavery in your state constitution. So you need to provide new state constitutions. They did not have to guarantee the right to vote in the new state constitutions. All the... All they had to do is just say, not mention slavery. And President Johnson appointed the Unionist Alexander Jackson, or known as A.J. Hamilton, as a provisional governor. He was a Texan. 
and he had opposed the Civil War. He had favored preserving the Union. So now Texas has to draft a new constitution, have the voters approve it or ratify it in an election, elect state and local officials, as well as federal representatives. So you see there's not much to come back in in under this scheme. And once the new legislature sent the senators to Congress, that would be the end of presidential reconstruction. And you'll recall at this time, and in fact until 1913, all U.S. senators were appointed by the state legislatures. Uh, this was a provision in the Constitution that the people would not directly elect the senators as we do now, but rather the state legislatures would elect the senators. <clears throat> so Hamilton's appointed governor and he appoints loyal unionists, people like him who had opposed Texas leaving the United States, and they were appointed to state and local positions. And then the Freedmen's Bureau that I mentioned earlier, the National Contact Text, established a headquarters in Texas, and then it had 21 field offices throughout East Texas. It helped the blacks uh, write and understand these labor contracts, uh, set up some schools, vocational training. Now, the former secessionists, in other words, the, the Confederates and su their supporters, continued to win elections, however, and they did not like the Freedmen Bureau being there trying to tell the newly freed slaves about their rights. Uh, this is a photo of a school that was set up by the Freedmen's Bureau. <clears throat> so this new state constitution declared secession null and void, said, you know, the law we'd passed before seceding from the United States is no longer active and recognized but did not ratify or formally approve the 13th Amendment abolishing slavery. And there was no mention of slavery in the Constitution. But the new Constitution did not give uh, blacks the same civil rights as whites and in, in essence established a whites-only government. These were called black codes, as I mentioned previously in the national context. And so what the legislature did next is pass a series of law to codify or put in writing the Constitution's denial of equality to blacks. Now, there were some positive aspects here. Well, why don't we look at those first? Uh, blacks were given the right to acquire and sell property. They were given the right to make contracts and enforce those contracts by going to court. And they also given the right to go into court to sue someone or to be sued in state courts. However, on the negative side, there were many more provisions. Blacks were not allowed to serve on juries. They were not allowed to testify in a courtroom against a white. They were not allowed to vote. And they were not allowed to hold political office. Texas legislature has set up a public school fund, but now, previously, but now the blacks were denied their share of public school funds, effectively keeping blacks out of the schools. Blacks were prohibited from marrying whites. And all the railroad companies were required to provide separate accommodations for whites and blacks. So they had to have separate cars or sections of railroad cars for whites and blacks. <clears throat> well, the Constitution now went to the voters. It had to be approved by the voters. There was a debate over, you know, how much reform was this? Uh, Mr. Throckmorton won election to be governor. <clears throat> uh, and the Constitution was, ratif was ratified or approved by the vote voters and so Texas re-entered the United States in August 1866 after these few minimal, minimal um, reforms. And all the elected offices throughout Texas, almost all of them 
were conservative unionists, unionists again being Texans who had opposed secession. So at this point, you know, apart from some of the, some of the provisions here, at least you have people in favor of the union and you don't have former Confederates in charge of Texas. Stay tuned, that will change very quickly. <clears throat> now you have the newly elected legislature. It sent um, a former secessionist, Oren Roberts, as a senator, and a former Confederate, David Burnett, to the Senate. Because remember, the state Senate in Austin decided who was going to be a U.S. senator. Well, the U.S. Senate in Washington refused to allow them to, to take their seats and most of the other Southern senators saying, these are just representatives of the Confederacy. We just defeated them. This is not the purpose of Reconstruction. And the group called the Radical Unionists, these were Republicans, favored more rights for the blacks. <clears throat> and former Confederates physically were attacking some of these, but the governor did little in response. Excuse me. Now we're going to see Reconstruction move out of the hands of the president to Congress because the so-called radical Republicans wanted to do more to reconstruct the South. They were uh, personally very angry at the South for having started the war, and they were furious that former Confederates were starting to run all of the Southern governments again, including Texas. So they did not want to have moderate reconstruction plans. Uh, they wanted to, to move in. And this, the word radical means they wanted to radically transform the southern states <clears throat> to um, allow more democracy and meaningful role for, for blacks. So a new reconstruction plan was um, imposed on the former Confederacy in 1867. It required Texas and other states to write a new constitution. They had to elect new officials. The states were required to ratify or approve all three of the Reconstruction Amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. And they also had to elect new representatives and senators. So <clears throat> to do this, the South was placed under military rule under the U.S. Army. And here you can see Texas and Louisiana are the same color, and they are um, part of the 5th military district that's headquartered in Galveston. So now the U.S. Army is running this, and they say, you know, we're going to have serious reform efforts. <clears throat> so General Sheridan in New Orleans um, ran the reconstruction program in Texas and Louisiana. <clears throat> he removed Throckmorton as governor and he appointed Peace as governor. He was another unionist. And he started to remove the conservative judges. <clears throat> so the Republicans at this point, they got the unionists and the black voters together. And of course, Many white voters opposed this, and they also opposed the need to rewrite the Constitution. But the South was effectively under military rule by the North at this time. Now, they had a <clears throat> convention to write a new Constitution. About 75% of the delegates to this Constitution were from Texas. They were not Northerners. Um, they sort of started a myth in Texas after this period, that there were Northerners who came down and wrote the new constitution. And these Northerners were called carpetbaggers because a carpet bag was a kind of like a suitcase they would use in those days. It was made, it looked like it was made of carpet with a handle on it. <clears throat> and the Southerners who worked with them were called scallywags, which was an insult. But in reality, the vast majority of the people who wrote, rewrote the Texas Constitution were born in the South and they were Unionists. Also, there were nine blacks and these were the first people ever to hold elected office in our state. <clears throat> 
<clears throat> here's an example of one, Walter Moses Burton uh, from Fort Bend County, here where I live. He was elected sheriff. He was elected as a delegate to the Republican convention to rewrite the Constitution. And he was also a state legislator from uh, Fort Bend County here. And in Fort Bend County at this time, there were twice as many blacks as whites, reflecting the great number of slaves there had been. <clears throat> so the Republicans, first of all, condemned the violence against the freed slaves and violence against whites who had opposed secession. There, I won't go into the details. The textbook has a lot of detail, but the Republicans started to split. But the moderate Republicans in Texas prevailed over the more radical Republicans. And they, they wrote the Constitution of 1869, which extended suffrage as well as other civil rights to black males. And it greatly expanded the role and authority of the governor, in, including the governor's uh, term of office was increased from two to four years. <clears throat> now, President Ulysses S. Grant um, was very pleased with this, and he also favored the ru radical Republican Davis uh, becoming governor. And Davis um, won against uh, the Democratic candidate and became governor by less than a hundred vote margin statewide. So now we have the radical Republicans with Governor Davis and they dominate the state legislature and the U.S. congressional delegation in Washington. <clears throat> well, quickly, the new legislature ratified the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to the U.S. Constitution. This action and the fact that they'd rewritten the state constitution formally ended the three years of congressional reconstruction in Texas. So remember, we had two years of presidential reconstruction followed by three years of uh, congressional reconstruction. But looking ahead, the doesn't look too good for the Republican Party because many, many whites were conservatives and they did not want to support the Republicans who favored two things that conservative whites didn't. One was the supremacy of the federal government and equal rights for blacks. And as we'll see very shortly in a few years, the Republicans uh, will lose power to the Democrats who will run the state for about the next hundred years. <clears throat> well, let's look at the Republican state government first four years, 1870 to 1874. There was a lot of political violence and there were branches of the Ku Klux Klan, but other organizations like the Ku Klux Klan, very active in the state, that were essentially very rough. Uh, racist whites who were attacking elected black officials during Reconstruction. They had been attacking Northern officials. And this greatly troubled, obviously, Governor Davis. The governor controlled the militia and the state police. And in fact, the majority of the members of the um, state police were black. And he more than doubled the number of judicial districts and appointed many new justices. And the Republicans also set up a centralized state public education system, which included black children as well as white children. Well, setting up this system cost quite a bit of money and that required increased taxation. Now, many white conservatives were very upset with this for two reasons. One is they did not want their children going to school with blacks. And the other was, was they didn't want to pay increased taxes. So we'll see shortly when the Democrats took over, they reversed this, excluded the black children. And the state no longer funded the schools, but they were uh, devolved down to local school districts, which we have today, you know, Katie's Independent School District, Houston, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> 
the legislature, the Republican legislature, also gave the governor more powers in, um, in his term of office. And finally, after many years of effort, um, the first university was set up in uh, Texas, and this was Texas A&M Agriculture Mechanical uh, University, which was set, set up in 1871. Of course, that's the, the reason they're called Aggies is because the A of A&M is agricultural and mechanical. And this was a joint federal state project because under the Merrill Land Grant in 1862, the U.S. Congress gave states federal lands that they could use or sell to finance the establishment of agricultural and mechanical universities to improve agriculture and industry in the United States. Well, in the case of Texas, you'll recall, Texas didn't have any federal land. All the land was owned by the state. So what Congress decided to do for Texas was it gave Texas uh, about 200,000 acres of land in Colorado and said to the state of Texas, okay, that's your land. You have the title. Now sell it and take the money and use that for your university system. So much of the funding came from the federal government. <clears throat> well, you had these tax pros, uh, protests from conservative whites, and that sort of united a strange group of moderate Republicans, conservative unionists, the, as well as people who formerly had been in favor of Texas leaving the United States and joining the um, Confederacy. So, you know, they all, they had their differences, but they said, we're all against these tax increases. So they supported Democratic candidates in October 1871 in a special congressional election. And then uh, a few months later in the, well, about a year later in the 1872 election, Democrats won most of the um, contests and they sent conservative Democrats to Congress and the local and state elected officials were opponents of Governor Davis. So we have a new Democratic legislature. It quickly reversed Davis's accomplishments uh, over the next year in 1873. And Davis, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Governor Davis was defeated in 1873 by a conservative Democrat and a former Confederate military captain by the name of Richard Koch. So here we have, you know, former Confederates coming back in to dominate the government. Uh, this is, oh, I should have put this slide a little earlier, sorry. This is a political cartoon from the time in favor of the Ku Klux Klan and other <laughs> radical groups. And here what we see on the right is the Ku Klux Klan. On the left, on the left we see the White League. That was one of these um, radical uh, racist groups like the Ku Klux Klan. And what it's showing is a black couple, uh, a black couple huddled there and it says worse than slavery. So what they're saying is what they're saying is we, you know, we would actually want to help the blacks because what they have now is worse than slavery. They're saying slavery were the good old days. And at the top, it says the union as it was, right? This is a white man's government. And so you had the white, white league, the KKK, and they used terror and political and economic to suppress political uh, mobility by the freed slaves. The Ku Klux Klan ended after the white conservatives came back into t power, which is right now, and that's called the redemption, because there was no need to have secret organizations that went around with white hood on, hoods on to terrorize the blacks. Now the government uh, was doing that. So this restoration of conservative democratic rule was known as redemption. 
by the white Southerners. And this was across the South. Redemption. It's almost biblical. And what it means is the white Democrats have redeemed their government from the radical Republicans. And it began in, in the case of Texas with Governor Koch's election in 1873. Now, Governor Davis claimed, well, the election was not run according to the law because the law required that the election period be four days instead of one day. And <clears throat> the um, and actually Governor Davis went to President Grant who said, well, this is a local issue. I'm not gonna use federal power to keep you in office from January until April. Well, so Koch resigned in January 1874, several months before his term was to end. And the Redeemer legislature, again, Redeemer are the conservative whites who are redeeming the uh, control of the state from the radical Republicans. They inaugurated um, Koch. And Davis was protesting, but then he decided he wasn't worth it. And he just went off and retired. Uh, this is a photo of Governor Richard Koch. <clears throat> well, Koch moved quickly to get rid of the radical Republicans. He appointed new, new justices, and he simply went in and removed others who'd been nominated by the re Republicans and, and replaced them. And so now the entire government of Texas uh, um, had virtually no Republicans. What you did is remove them from the judiciary, the legislature, and the legislature they've been elected, and of course now the governor is a Democrat. So the conservative Democrats who called themselves redemptionists, redemp redemption Democrats, now controlled all three branches of the state government. This lasts for almost 100 years until the 1960s, 1950s, 1960s. Now let's look quickly at their, <clears throat> the Constitution that was passed by these Redeemer or conservative Democrats. This is the 1876 Constitution. So one of the first things the Democrats said is let's change our state constitution uh, because the last one was written by you know, radical Republicans um, with the support of Northerners. So they, they had a constitutional convention and it produced the 1876 Constitution, which is still the Constitution of the state of Texas. It's been amended over 500 times um, since 1876, but it's still the 1876 Constitution as the basic framework. It greatly limited the powers of the governor to reduce the centralization in Austin. The legislature can only meet every other year, which is still the case. Reduced expenditures by the state government. A general reduction in state government activities. If the government has to do something, let's have it done at the local level, you know, the city or the county, not at the state level. And this you know, greatly reflects the conservative democratic belief in opposing active centralized state authority. And as I mentioned, this is still the Texas Constitution. <clears throat> well, most important point is adopting this Constitution of 1876 eliminated all the post-war reforms, all the progress that had been made the first two years under presidential reconstruction, the next three years under reconstruction, congressional reconstruction, that was, most of it was eliminated. Blacks, in principle, still retained the right to vote because the 15th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution stated that you cannot deny voting on the basis of race. And so it, because of that, it was impossible to put in the state constitution that blacks can't vote. But very quickly, Texas and all the other southern states 
came up with all sorts of schemes that they thought were very clever and they were very effective to end black voting. And one of these schemes was a literacy test you had to take. I have an example of one in Canvas. Uh, the example in Canvas is from the state of Louisiana in the 1950s. Um, but it, essentially the same type of test. And you'll read in the directions for the test. You have 10 minutes to complete this three-page test. And if you miss one answer, you fail the test. And I challenge all of you to take the test. I hate to admit it as your professor, but I wasn't able to complete the test in 10 minutes. It's uh, not that I'm illiterate, but it's quite lengthy and it's kind of confusing. So I had one student in one class who, who said he had, because it was a class in person. I gave copies to everyone. I said, let's go. And one guy said, I finished it just under 10 minutes. I said, really? So we went over it and he got it all right. So, you know, uh, I should have given him some kind of reward for that. But and what would happen if a black, if a white person, well, a white person didn't have to take it because if they'd had a fifth grade education, even if they hadn't, you know, who was running the voting systems? The whites. And so farmer Billy Bob would show up and, you know, they'd say, oh, you don't, yeah, we know you, you, you sure you can read and write, just go ahead and, you know, you don't need to take the test. Other tests were on detailed issues on constitutional law, which you had to be a lawyer to pass. They also had a, oh, word's missing here, and a poll tax, you had to pay $5 or something, or, you know, the equivalent today of $100. And obviously, the freed slaves didn't have cash like that. So they came up with many, many clever schemes. They never said blacks can't vote. And they just said that they wanted to have people who were literate voting because, you know, otherwise, how could they make a decision? And those type of barriers to black voting continued until the 1960s, until the 1960s, 1964, 1965, there was a federal legislation passed by Congress to eliminate them. Now let's look quickly at the legacy of Reconstruction. Who cares? Big deal. Why do we care about Reconstruction? Well, Reconstruction returned at the end of Reconstruction, didn't really reconstruct much. The conservative landholding elites came back into power. I mean, slavery was ended, yes. And there was no longer the federal military there. The U.S. Army was no longer in Texas. So Texas and other southern states, Texas was not unique, began rolling back civil liberties for blacks. And we, we've seen that in the Constitution and in practice. Now, Reconstruction at first had offered the newly freed slaves, the black Texans, great hope. And then despair as they encountered violence. And then they found that, you know, they effectively couldn't vote. <clears throat> Blacks did have some limited success, some of them, in becoming owners of small farms, um, earning wages, a craftsman, and sometimes they had local, they were elected locally into local um, political office. But by, <clears throat> by 1900, that had mainly ended. Most ended up working on farms on someone else's land, and it was usually the, their former owner was when they were slaves. On the positive side, the the limited information we have indicates that most blacks lived with nuclear families. By that we mean husband, wife, and children. And that was often impossible under slavery if one member of the family was sold off to another slave. And after redemption, by redemption here, we mean the return of um, racist Democrats to run the government. Many of these gains were increasingly insecure. <clears throat> now, for their part, the white supremacists and the Redeemer Democrats who took over the government, they looked back, and they have continued to do this, um, 
it's become sort of part of the popular history of Texas. And not all the people who say this are racist. And they say, well, the Reconstruction era was federal government tyranny over the state of Texas because the U.S. Army came in, the U.S. Army ran the state, and they forced uh, many policies. And this is a very popular interpretation of Reconstruction in the state of Texas. Uh, and it's held not just by people who are racist, but this is what people read about in, you know, in school a number of years ago or whatever. And what it does is it says the redeemers, the racist Democrats who came in, restored honest, limited government after these northern carpetbaggers and blacks and Republicans had gotten together to oppress Texas. Uh, this popular interpretation of Reconstruction, it's, it's usually sort of just people have that general idea. It's contributed heavily to a strong hostility by many Texans and many across the South to the federal government. They view the federal government in terms of Reconstruction. The federal government came in. The states were occupied by the U.S. Army for a number of years and told them how to uh, run their states. And it's led to, you know, many cries that we should have more states' rights. And we'll see this as we move along in the course. Okay, I'm sorry this was so long. Um, and in, in the next lecture, we'll start looking at the Old West. Thank you very much.